Welcome to Ecotherapy and Introduction. This is video one for the first hour of the online continuing education class. This course is sponsored by the Mindful Ecotherapy Center. You can learn more at mindfulecotherapy.org. If you're watching this video on YouTube and you're interested in getting continuing education credit for this, you can go to mindfulecotherapy.org and register for the course there. There you'll be able to view all the course materials in addition to the video, all the handouts and all the other objectives, things of that nature. And you'll also be able to take the post-test, which will qualify you for continuing education credit. If this is the first time you've taken a course with the Mindful Ecotherapy Center, what you will do is you will click on the course, and then that will open up a window with multiple lessons in each course. You complete the lessons in order. And once you finish the lesson, you click on the complete button and it will take you to the next lesson. Once you've completed all of the lessons in this particular course, there's also a series of five experiential exercises in ecotherapy that you would need to do on your own. They're self-guided, but there are instructions later on in the course on how to complete them. Once you've done all of those and completed all the educational materials in this course package, then you would be ready to take the post-test. The way you take the post-test is to click on the uh, button at the, after the last lesson that says post-test, and you would be able to take the quiz then, and you have to pass it with a score of 80% or higher, but you have three opportunities to take it. So if you don't make 80% the first time, you can take it again. Once you've completed it successfully, a certificate of completion is automatically generated, and that will be on the page where the course is found. In other words, you go to your page that says Courses, and there, under your uh, particular course, is the certificate of completion for that course. The process is automatic upon passing the test. Just a word of caution here, when you're registering for the test, the username that you define when you sign up for this course is the name that will be printed on the certificate. So if you need to have your name on the certificate, make sure you use your real name and not some sort of screen name or nickname, because otherwise that will be what prints on the certificate. Now, if you have any more questions about the course or any other thing about the Mindful Ecotherapy Center, you can email me at chuck at mindfulecotherapy.com. I am the course instructor, and I usually check that email every day. Hopefully I'll be able to get back to you within 48 hours. Now let's get started on the course. As a part of one of the lessons, you'll see course materials. This includes a series of documents and handouts that you will need in order to successfully complete the course. If you haven't already done so, you might want to download those and have them handy when you go through the course. Let's do a brief overview of what the course materials in the video production contains. There are five one-hour videos that you will have to watch. They are broken down into five separate lessons. Each lesson has a basic overview of the materials in that one hour, and also the videos. So first you might want to look over in the overview section what each video has in it, and then go forward and view each video. And you can pause them. This is, this is not a timed course. If you need to view them a little bit at the time, you can pause them, stop them, and then continue on with them later. You have 180 days to complete the course. If you need more time than that, you might want to email me at chuck at mindfulecotherapy.com and let me know so I can extend your time. In video hour one, we're going to be talking about the definition of ecotherapy the need for ecotherapy, a brief history of ecotherapy, and then we're going to look at some of the different types of ecotherapy. So that would be the video that you're watching now. The next video, video hour two, includes nature as nurture, in other words, the healing power of nature, nature and child development, how nature is important to have healthy children. And finally, an educative model on ecotherapy. How do you create an ecotherapy program 
what do you need to have in it, what is not necessary to have, that sort of thing. In Hour 3, we're going to be looking at ecotherapy and mindfulness. If you're viewing this video from the website, you may be familiar with the fact that the Mindful Ecotherapy Center offers certification courses in mindfulness-based ecotherapy. Ecotherapy and mindfulness go hand in hand. You might say that mindfulness is the what, and ecotherapy is the how. In other words, nature and experiences in nature facilitate mindful states of being. We'll get a little bit more into that in this course. If you're interested in pursuing that further, you might look at the certification courses in mindfulness-based ecotherapy. We're also going to look at something called web strings. Web strings are all about connection, and we'll go into more detail about what that means when we get to that section. And then finally, the 54 natural senses, postulated by Dr. Michael Cohen of Project Nature Connect. We're taught that we only have five senses, but Dr. Cohen postulates that there may be as many as 54 natural senses. In video hour four, we're going to look at some of the benefits of ecotherapy. There are thousands of studies at this point in the benefits of ecotherapy, and we'll be reviewing some of the most important ones and some of the most current ones. We're also going to look at ecotherapy and addiction. In other words, how can you use ecotherapy to treat addiction? And then ecotherapy and trauma. Ecotherapy has been demonstrated to be particularly effective in treating trauma victims. In the fifth and final video hour, we'll be looking at some ethical issues involved in ecotherapy, about practicing ecotherapy in natural settings instead of in an office environment. We're also going to look at some colleges with ecotherapy programs. And then finally, we're going to look at the future of ecotherapy. Where do we go from here as a model and as a therapeutic paradigm? Now let's get down to it. First off, before we start talking about ecotherapy, we need to define what we mean by ecotherapy. Before we do that, we have to understand what ecopsychology is. Ecopsychology is the study of how nature impacts mental health and psychological and emotional well-being. Ecotherapy, on the other hand, is applied ecopsychology. In other words, applying the tools and techniques of ecopsychology in a therapeutic environment. In the early days of ecotherapy, it was restricted to meaning the anxiety that people suffer when they realize the amount of damage we're doing to our natural ecological environment. But as people began to study it more and more, they came to realize that using nature itself as a means of alleviating mental health problems like anxiety, stress, depression, addiction, etc., etc., that it needed to be a broader definition than that. So ecotherapy, as used now, means using nature in a therapeutic setting. Simpic in 2010 defined green care as a diverse set of activities that use nature and nature-based activities as a form of behavioral health intervention. That comes from the Simpic study in 2010 known as Green Care, a Conceptual Framework, a report of the Working Group of the Health Benefits of Green Care. And you can find it there if you are interested in further research. We're going to be talking a little more about the green care model later on in the course materials for those who are interested. What about the need for ecotherapy? A look at the ecotherapy research evidence by Craig Chalquist in 2009 outlined three common themes in his rationale for ecotherapy. The first is that disconnection from the natural world in which we evolved produces a variety of psychological symptoms that include anxiety, frustration, and depression. These symptoms cannot be attributed solely to the intrapsychic or intrafamilial dynamics. In other words, these symptoms are caused by being disconnected from nature and not because of any interdynamic processes that might be going on in societies in which we live. The second is reconnection to the natural world. That can be through gardens, animals, 
nature walks outside, or nature brought indoors. This not only alleviates the symptoms talked about earlier, but also brings a larger capacity for health, self-esteem, self-relatedness, social connection, and joy. Reconnection also works across treatment modalities to replace a pathological sense of inner deadness or alienation from self, others, and world with a rekindling of inner aliveness and enjoyment of relatedness to self, to others, and to the world. When we get to the web string section later, we're going to talk about some of the power of nature to connect us to ourselves, to others, and to the world at large. Now let's look at some statistics related to the need for ecotherapy. In 1900, 40% of U.S. households lived on farms. By 1990, only 1.9% of U.S. households lived on farms. In other words, urbanization has changed people's relationship with nature. Many aspects of our culture now teach people not to spend time in nature. And this urbanization, of course, has changed people's relationship with nature. It's hard to have a relationship with something if you don't spend any time with it. And another factor in the need for ecotherapy is that parents have become fearful about their children playing outdoors. And children who grow up in primarily built environments often fear nature largely because it's unfamiliar. We often fear what we don't understand. And if we don't spend any time with nature, we don't understand nature. So it's only natural that we would come to fear it because we don't know anything about it. One of the benefits of ecotherapy is that it offers a systematic method of reintroducing our children and ourselves to nature in a safe way so that we are able to reconnect with nature, to learn more about it, and to decrease our fear of the unknown. According to Mahler and Townsend and Moore, since the Industrial Revolution, Urbanization has limited opportunities for experiences in nature. We all have jobs, we all live in the suburbs or in the city, and we don't have a lot of time or opportunity to connect with nature. Physical inactivity results in 1.9 million deaths worldwide annually, according to the World Health Organization 2004 study. That means roughly 1 in 25 of all deaths is due to physical inactivity. And experiences in nature foster healthy physical activities. Hiking, going for walks, swimming, mountain climbing. All of these opportunities allow you physical activity. So the more time you spend in nature, the more likely you are to engage in physical activity and thus improve your health and your physical well-being as well as your mental well-being. Here are some of the benefits of time in natural spaces. Number one, it strengthens neighborhood ties. Part of the reason for that is if you're spending time in nature with your neighbors, going to the park, going on walks, that sort of thing, you're not stuck in front of the TV, the computer, or the smartphone. You're actually interacting with your fellow man, your fellow human beings. So this uh, time in nature tends to strengthen our relationships with others around us because we're actually spending time face-to-face -face with them and not with electronic gadgets. Time in nature also reduces crime. This is an interesting uh, paradigm here. Part of the reason for that may be that spending time in nature increases senses of well-being and senses of self-efficacy and just overall general mental health. And so that has a tendency to reduce crime and uh, the reasons that people want to engage in criminal activities. Time in nature stimulates social interactions among children. If you ever spend time in a park or a playground, you know this to be true, especially if you're a parent. Your children love to play with each other. If they can put down the toys long enough, put down the electronic gadgets, the video games, that sort of thing, and actually go out and interact with each other, then they enjoy that time. And because of this, they're building social skills. They're building the ability to interact with other people in a productive way. Time in nature strengthens family connections. If you've ever gone on a family picnic or a family outing to the beach or to the mountains or to some other outdoor area, 
you know that that f- allows you an opportunity to spend time with your family and to enjoy each other's company. Oddly enough, spending time in nature also decreases domestic violence. This may be in part because it reduces stress, it reduces senses of depression, and those would naturally decrease the uh, motivations for domestic violence. Another benefit of ecotherapy or time in natural spaces is that it assists new immigrants to cope with the transition from changing from one nation, one culture, to another. And this is an interesting one for all those insurance providers out there. (laughs) Nature, spending time in nature and ecotherapy is cost-effective for health benefits. You don't have to go to the beach or to the mountains. If you have a backyard or a park in your local city or local town, you can just go there and you get the same health benefits. Even if you live in an urban place like Los Angeles or New York, you can bring some of the natural world into your own home by putting plants in your house, by maybe getting a small animal or a pet, or even just playing sounds of nature, as we're going to look at later. If you listen to natural sounds, that can be soothing as well. That's why there's a multi-billion dollar industry in nature recordings. And the interesting thing about this is that insurance companies don't routinely reimburse for ecotherapy, yet it's a very cost-effective way of dealing with mental health issues. Children also benefit from ecotherapy. Kellerts in 2002 said that a child's direct and ongoing experience of accessible nature is an essential, critical, and irreplaceable dimension of healthy maturation and development. Ruth Wilson in 2008 gives reasons why children need to feel nature and not just think about it. And E. O. Wilson in 1984 believes that there's a biologically based inherent human need to affiliate with life and lifelike processes. In other words, human identity and personal fulfillment depend on our relationship to nature. I grew up on a farm in the late 60s and the early 70s, and I can tell you that some of my experiences there taught me a lot about life and a lot about being in the world and how to interact with other people and with other living creatures. And I can't think of robbing a child of that experience. That is something in my mind as well from my own personal experience that is critical in the development of a healthy child, spending time outdoors in nature. In 1986, the World Health Organization proclaimed that health care is not separate from caring for the environment. You may have heard a quote attributed to Chief Seattle that says that uh, we are not separate from the web of life. We are a part of it. And what that means is that what we do to the natural world, we do to ourselves. So our own health care depends on caring for the environment. If we pollute the water, and we drink the water, we've polluted ourselves. If we poison the air, and we breathe the air, then we've polluted ourselves. If we take in toxins into our body by taking in pesticides, poisons, that sort of thing, we've damaged the environment, and we've damaged ourselves. We've damaged ourselves by damaging the environment. So it should be fairly obvious that healthcare cannot be separate from caring for the environment because we depend on the environment for our survival. And multiple studies have demonstrated the link between environmental health and personal health. The more polluted your environment is, the more disorganized, chaotic your environment is, the more out of touch with the natural world your environment is, the more likely you are to have difficulties in physical health and in mental health for yourself. In short, if you poison the well, then the well poisons you when you drink the water. Let's look now at a brief history of ecotherapy. Ecotherapy is at least as old as the reindeer age shamans of 40,000 years ago who used the power of nature to heal. Also, Ayurvedic medicine, 
which is the indigenous Indian medical system. We're talking about India, not Native American Indian. There's also Tibetan medicine, Native American medicine, and traditional Chinese medicine, which are all at least 5,000 years old. They are examples of medical systems that see being in nature as integral to healing, health, and well-being. In such natural systems, people keep a physical and spiritual connection with nature. In the shamanic world, sickness is viewed as being out of balance with nature. And part of the uh, activity of a healing shaman is to try to restore that balance in some way. According to Ulrich and Parsons in 1992, over a thousand years ago, people in both Asian and Western cultures believed that plants and gardens were beneficial for patients in need of healing. They were known as healing gardens. And according to Nightingale in 1860, European and American hospitals in the 1800s commonly contained gardens full of healing plants. So it would not be uncommon for your doctor in that time period to go out into the garden to pick your medicine for you. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution, however, medicine became less holistic and therapeutic gardens were replaced with parking lots. In the time of the 1800s, you could look out the window and see a natural healing garden outside of the window. Nowadays, you look out in the window of the hospital and you see a parking lot, you see cars, you see the city. I will say that some of that is changing, though. They've discovered that just by having a view of a therapeutic garden outside of your hospital window, you tend to recover faster. So there are changes being made. However, the point here is that nature itself has the ability to heal, especially with healing plants and healing gardens. I was born in 1959, so I can tell you from personal experience that in the 1960s, the Back to Nature movement began. I was a young child when this happened, but as I said, I grew up on a farm in the 60s. So uh, it just seemed normal to me. It didn't seem that there needed to be any Back to Nature movement because nature was a part of my life every day. In 1964, the Wilderness Act presumed the need for people to enjoy natural spaces as a requirement for mental and physical health. And then Richard Louvre in 2005 wrote a book called The Last Child in the Woods. He updated it in 2008, but this book greatly increased awareness that children spend less time with nature today. And this less time in nature can lead to increased obesity. It can make the symptoms of ADHD far worse and cause poorer general health for the reasons that we've already gone over. The book came about when Louvre was talking to one of his children about his experience catching crawdads as a child. And he realized as he was trying to tell the story that the child had no frame of reference for what he was talking about. The child literally didn't understand what he meant by going to the creek and looking for crawdads. Didn't know what a crawdad was. Didn't know the experience of wading in a creek. So this started Louvre to thinking about it and Last Child in the Woods was born. In this book, he coined the term nature deficit disorder to describe what is happening to our children, that the less time they spend in nature, the more they start to develop mental health problems and physical health problems. By the mid to late 1990s, the concept of eco-psychology and our need to heal and be healed by the planet and by time and nature had become more widespread to the point that today eco-psychology has developed into a discipline with college textbooks and graduate programs, and of course, courses like the one you're listening to now. Many colleges and universities now offer programs in eco-psychology and eco-therapy, and we're going to look at some of those programs later on as part of this course. Ecotherapy and ecopsychology are part of a wider back-to-nature culture sweeping across the world. This movement includes sustainable farming, which is a way of reducing your carbon footprint while farming, in other words, putting back at least as much as you take out of nature. There's also the local food movement. You may have heard the term localvore. <laughs> what that means is that you buy food 
and consume food that is produced as close to your home as possible. The uh, average food item in the average grocery store travels an average of about 1,500 miles to get to the grocery store. So the local food movement is looking towards sustaining farmers in the local community by supporting them through buying their produce there. And it also looks towards reducing fossil fuel emissions by reducing the need for transportation over great distances for food items. So the local food movement is expanding. And I live in rural South Carolina. There's even a local food movement here now. Uh, A lot of the restaurants locally advertise as a matter of pride that the produce that they use, the meats that they use, all come from local farmers. So that is a big and growing movement. There's also the organic gardening movement. Now, word of caution here with this. Um, There is no legal definition of organic farming. So, in other words, you can slap a label on something and call it organic, even though it may not have been raised in such a way as to really be organic to meet the standards of organic food raising. So you might want to do a little research if you're pursuing an organic diet. There's the alternative energy movement that includes things like solar power, uh, biofuels, wind power, that sort of thing, which is gaining momentum all over the world. And then there's environmental awareness movements, things like natural building, which means building out of sustainable materials, uh, harvested in some cases right off of the building site. In other words, using trees that grew on the building site as part of the building materials. Or in some cases, even uh, earth. There's a thing called cob building, which is similar to adobe, except that it's not shaped into bricks. You just build the walls out of dirt by stacking the next layer on top of the other one, and it's built into one piece or things like straw bale building, where you build a house out of straw bale. And then after the straw bale is stacked, it's coated with plaster or some other material to make it airtight and water resistant, and of course flame resistant. There are also things like green weddings, where the wedding itself is held by using as many sustainable materials as possible. Ecotourism, which is uh, tourism based on the principles of ecology. There is uh, things like the green clothing movement, where people use recyclable materials in their clothing. Hemp, cotton, natural materials, things like that. The natural movement touches everything from birth to death, as a matter of fact. There are natural methods of childbirth, like using midwives, doulas, things like that. There's also natural burial, which is now uh, becoming quite a thing. In natural burial, the body is not preserved with formaldehyde. It's not wasting thousands of BTUs in cremation. Your body is just left in its natural state and buried. And in some of these natural burial sites, they have become natural nature preserves. In other words, the cemetery used for a natural burial becomes a nature preserve as well. And that prevents development on that property and keeps it safe for posterity. So basically, the sustainability movement is touching all aspects of life in one way or another. And that includes this ecotherapy program. It is also touching mental health. We're realizing that we need nature in order to have a mentally healthy viewpoint on life. Now, let's look at some types of ecotherapy. Returning to our definition of ecotherapy, you could summarize it by saying that ecotherapy is strengthening your relationship to nature. In formal ecotherapy, a trained therapist leads you through different activities to develop a balanced relationship with nature that benefits your well-being in some way. These sessions can be adapted to suit different levels of mobility and fitness and different disorders or different emotional needs. For example, if someone is in a wheelchair or has to walk with a cane or things like that, you're probably not going to take them rock climbing or hiking on a big mountain trail. But you can do outdoor chair yoga with them. Or you can just use nature sounds in your therapy sessions or introduce plants into your office or things like that 
just any way that you can allow them to experience nature. My office has a door that opens to the outside, and we have a nice little patio out there, and sometimes I take my patients out there and just let them sit in the sunlight while we do our sessions. So you can adapt it to suit different levels of mobility, different levels of need. And uh, ecotherapy sessions often include some type of psychotherapy, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. And we'll talk more about that later. Some types of ecotherapy. First off, there's something called adventure therapy. This can also be looked at as wilderness adventure therapy or wilderness experiences, that sort of thing. This is uh, some sort of quest. Um, it could be as simple as just going on a hiking trail and seeing how far you can get. This is also something like those ropes courses you may be familiar with, where you climb a tower and ride a rope down through a canopy of a forest or something like that. could be things like river tubing, which I've done before, Riving, river kayaking, where you take the folks on the river to experience the power of nature on the water. Uh, there's also animal-assisted interventions, also known as AAI, and then animal-assisted therapy, AAT. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between the two. Animal-assisted interventions don't require the presence of a trained therapist. This could be anything from having animal-assistant dogs, animal-assistant pets of some sort, all the way up to having someone who is not a trained therapist just having someone spend time with animals, with pets, things like that. My wife and I went on a Caribbean cruise several years ago, and there was an adventure there where you went out into the water and fed stingrays. They came up to you and ate the food out of your hands, and you could pick them up and pet them if you wanted to. So that sort of thing. That was not a trained therapist there. It was just a person who has had a lot of experience with stingrays. Now, animal-assisted therapy, on the other hand, is where a trained therapist is using animals in some way as an intervention tool. Some types of those might be equine-assisted therapy in which the horse is used as a tool for some facilitating change in a therapeutic environment. Care farming. Care farming is a means of therapeutic intervention where you simply take care of animals on a farm or do the chores on a farm. You go to a farm for a couple of days a week or a couple of hours a day and just volunteer to help out. And the action of spending time in nature in a helping way itself is the intervention. Um, one of the things that you see a lot uh, that is coming up, uh, especially even here where I live, is something called community gardens, and in that case, a piece of land held in trust by the community is dedicated to creating a garden, a food garden, and then everybody that works, volunteers on that garden, gets a share of the produce that it makes. And in such a case, what happens there is that you're volunteering your time in order to get a share of the produce, but it also affords you an opportunity for therapeutic purposes. Just There's just something about participating in a garden and seeing the miracle of things growing that's therapeutic in itself. And then, of course, ecotherapy itself is a, a type of therapy. And that could be as simple as just spending time in nature, just going outside and sitting on the porch and watching the squirrels and the birds. However, for the purposes of this course, ecotherapy refers to a systematic type of therapy. In other words, uh, ecotherapy is experiences in nature facilitated by a trained therapist or a trained counselor. More types of ecotherapy. Environmental conservation, also known as green gems. In this case, people get together in groups and go out and exercise by doing things like picking up trash on the side of the road or picking up trash on hiking trails, that sort of thing. And that can include any type of conservation effort uh, from something as simple as picking up bottles and cans on the side of the road or on the hiking trail to actually clearing out land that has junk on it, like rusty cars and old appliances, things like that. That leads to green exercise therapy. 
Green exercise therapy is experiencing nature through exercise, running, jogging, mountain climbing, rock climbing, ropes courses, things like that. There's also a thing called nature arts and crafts, and that can be making things from nature. For example, I use talking sticks when I use groups. Uh, the idea of a talking stick, if you're not familiar with it, is that when you're having a group, only the person holding the stick has the permission to speak. If someone else wants to speak, they have to wait until they get the stick passed to them. So a talking stick can be an eco art project. In other words, everyone in the group has to make their own talking stick and they have to personalize it to themselves. So when I do that, I have folks go out into the woods and find a stick about the length of their forearm and then find natural materials to decorate it with. Of course, uh, sometimes it's hard to find natural materials in the environment. So I also have a ready supply of natural materials like feathers, leather strings, things of that nature, so that when the person makes a talking stick, it's personalized specifically to them. They can paint it, wood burn it, decorate it in whatever way speaks to them so that they have their own talking stick. And not only is that a good therapeutic tool to use in groups so that only the person talking has the stick, you can also personalize it so that it tells a story about the person who owns it. And I have done that in the past where we take the talking sticks and put them on the table and then everybody in the group tries to figure out which talking stick belongs to which person. Of course, that only works if they weren't witnessing each other making them in the first place. But it can be a fun and productive exercise. But there are, that's just some of the ways that you can introduce uh, nature arts and crafts into therapy. Another one that I use a lot is something called sand tray therapy, where you use a sand tray and patients create scenes in the tray based on either natural materials or figurines. There's also a social and therapeutic horticulture, and this has two purposes. One is that it improves a natural space. Two is that it is a group activity that everyone can experience the healing power of nature together with. That can include things like community gardens that we already spoke of, where the community comes together and plants a garden, and everyone who participates shares in the results of that garden. Or it could be road improvement projects where people go out and pick up trash on the side of the road. Or just planting trees, uh, somehow improving a natural environment. And then there's wilderness therapy. Wilderness therapy can take all sorts of uh, manifestations. It could be adventure therapy where a group of people come together in a wilderness environment to do some sort of task. One common one that you see a lot is building a fire with a bow and a pile of kindling. But this can also include things like pilgrimages, where a group or an individual is seeking something in particular on a journey through the woods or through a wilderness, or a vision quest where a person is not necessarily traveling, but just spending time in nature seeking a life purpose or seeking a vision for the future. Adventure therapy can include adventure activities focused on psychological support, where a group of people come together to support each other in completing a task, like a ropes course, or climbing a mountain, uh, climbing rocks, things like that. And these tend to be fairly strenuous physical activities incorporated with psychological exercises. There's usually some sort of defined goal that everyone's trying to achieve. And again, this is usually done in a group setting so that the members of the group can support each other. And if someone's having a particular difficulty, then the rest of the group can support them as they try to conquer whatever the goal is. And again, this might include activities like rafting, ropes courses, rock climbing, caving, kayaking, things like that. And this is a, usually an activity that focuses on ways to build trust and raise confidence. In other words, finding trust in the group being able to ask for help when it's needed and rely on and trust others for support. And in doing so, it helps you to raise confidence and self-efficacy. And here's one of my favorites, animal-assisted ecotherapy. 
I'm going to read a quote here from Kellert and Wilson, 1993. Natural history observations may be a starting point, but they are strongly molded by cultural constructs and by our need to affiliate with the rest of creation through metaphor. Signifying by means of animals takes place at deep levels of human consciousness, emanating from the same type of psychic experiences as myth, poetry, and religion, whose language is also symbols. For example, the Anglican Church defines a sacrament as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And that's the same mentality behind things like totem animals, spirit quests, that sort of thing. So we're drawing on the power of metaphor and ecotherapy as well. And this is where animal-assisted ecotherapy can come in handy. Now, there are two types of animal-assisted ecotherapy. The first is animal-assisted interventions, or AAI. And that can be simply defined as spending time with animals. That can include things like being in spaces such as farms where you come into contact with animals, or spending relaxing time with animals while feeding or nurturing them. And uh, animal assistance can also be used to assist mobility and improve coordination. The uh, animal-assisted interventions can include things like uh, therapy dogs, therapy cats, therapy animals. It tends to be less structured than animal-assisted therapy. The difference between an animal-assisted intervention and animal-assisted therapy is the presence of a trained therapist, preferably one trained in animal-assisted interventions. Animal-assisted therapy, or AAT, focuses on building a therapeutic relationship with animals. And this is a formal type of therapy using guided contact animals such as horses, dogs, cats, or other animals. And the focus is on the interaction and bonding between the patient and the animal. And these are led, as we said earlier, by an experienced therapist trained in animal-assisted therapy. This could be one-on-one -on -one or group therapy, and either way, they tend to be very effective. We spoke briefly about care farming earlier, but let's go into a little more detail. Care farming involves looking after farm animals, growing crops, or helping to manage woodlands and natural spaces. Sessions in care farming generally run for half days to whole days, and many farms hold open house days to try things out before joining a program. So this tends to be a win-win situation because the farm gets so much needed help for free and the patients who are experiencing care farming get the therapeutic value of spending time in nature. Some things can be as simple as grooming a horse or picking vegetables or planting vegetables, things like that. All of these activities have beneficial effects just spending time on a farm and seeing up close how nature interacts and how our food is produced, that sort of thing, that in itself can be therapeutic. Now looking a little closer at environmental conservation are green gems. The basic idea of a green gem is combining physical exercise with conservation work. And, of course, the tasks vary depending on location and time of year. For example, in the summertime, you might be planting vegetables, planting trees, or removing trash from national parks or the sides of the roads. In the wintertime, you might be shoveling snow, that sort of thing. The sessions include breaks so you can work at your own pace. The idea here is not to get a bunch of work done as quickly as possible. The idea is to experience the therapeutic value of doing the work while exercising. And of course, if there are any tools or other equipment involved, the group leader has to be trained in the use of those tools and then has to be able to show members of the group how to use them as well. And in such case, there are liability contracts to be signed, that sort of thing. If you're training people to use sharp implements, you want to make sure that they know how to do it and that you reduce your liability should they injure themselves. Green exercise therapy is simply doing exercise in nature. That can be physical activities in green spaces like yoga. This is very popular. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the Mindful Ecotherapy Center, 
where I practice now, there is a yoga center as well. And we do yoga quite often outdoors on the grounds. You can also include walking. One of my favorite activities is something called mindful walking. We also have a labyrinth on the grounds at the Mindful Ecotherapy Center. And we often experiment with mindful walking by walking the labyrinth. And of course, building a labyrinth itself can be a therapeutic green exercise activity, carrying stones and forming them and shaping them into a labyrinth. There's plenty of plans online for building your own labyrinth if you're interested in something like this. And then the basics of jogging, running, cycling, things like that in nature as well. And that can include anything from walking on gentle strolls to strenuous hiking up the side of a mountain or running, cycling, etc., etc. Usually when this is done in the context of ecotherapy, it's facilitated by a trained leader who knows safety precautions, what to do if somebody sprains an ankle in the wilderness or gets a scrape falling off the side of a mountain and things like that. Let's look a little more closely at nature arts and crafts therapy. As we said earlier, this is simply doing art in or with nature. This can be artistic activities which take place in a natural environment and use natural materials such as wood, grass, feathers, shells, and clay. And the labyrinth activity that we were talking about earlier, that is an artistic expression, but it's also a physical activity, moving rocks around in the shape of a labyrinth. And there's something called natural sculpture as well, and that can be made of something as simple as adobe, clay, sand, and straw mixed together, and then you shape that into a statue or other type of sculpture. You might work directly in the environment and create permanent installations outdoors using natural building techniques or those natural statues that we were talking about earlier, sculptures. Or you might use the environment or scenery as inspiration for artwork, as simple as going out in the woods and painting landscapes, that sort of thing. And we spoke briefly earlier about natural building. But that's also a type of nature arts and crafts therapy. And this is one of my favorites because it blends so many things together. As we said earlier, natural building involves building out of natural materials, preferably materials that are harvested straight off of the site. That includes earth, sand, straw, clay, wood, stone, etc., etc. One of my favorite materials is cob, which is a mixture of clay, sand, and straw, similar to adobe except it's not shaped into bricks. The word cob comes from the old English word gob, and basically you shape the clay sand and straw into little grapefruit-sized balls, and then you press them together into the wall so that it all becomes one piece. And the advantage to that is that it can be sculptural. It's uh, just like modeling clay. You can make some interesting shapes as the one in the pictured here in the slide. They don't have to be square, boxy houses. They can have organic shapes. And the thing I like about natural building, number one, it gets you out into the world, out into nature. Number two, it teaches you a new building skill that is sustainable and creative and non-toxic. Number three, it's a community activity where everybody gets together and enjoys experiencing time in nature while creating something beautiful. Looking a little more closely at social and therapeutic horticulture, that can be gardening or growing food in allotments, like the community gardens we spoke about earlier. There's a variety of tasks available, so you don't have to have everybody digging weeds or planting or fertilizing or things like that. There are very different specialized tasks that everyone can do and take part in, so you're able to match the activity to the person's skill set. And it can be adapted to suit a wide range of abilities and mobility levels. So just because you may be handicapped in a wheelchair or not able to walk or have arthritis or things like that doesn't mean that you're not able to participate. There are things that can be found for people of all skill sets and all physical abilities. These usually take place outside in community gardens or nurseries or can be inside in greenhouses. These are usually or preferably run by qualified and experienced tutors 
who know what they're doing. And that requires a special skill set. You have to be able to address therapeutic issues, but you also have to have a green thumb or be able to teach people how to grow things. And this could also lead to work experiences, such as selling produce at a farmer's market or working as a farmhand. There are several programs nationwide that teach people who have no job skills how to do these things, and then they're able to go out and find work on a farm or work in a greenhouse or work in a nursery, things like that. Looking more closely now at wilderness therapy. As we said earlier, that involves spending time in the wild with a group doing physical and group building activities, such as making shelters, hiking, survival skills, rope courses, that sort of thing. What this is is a structured opportunity to challenge yourself in a wilderness or a remote setting. And again, the word challenge here is more of a psychological, a therapeutic challenge, and not necessarily a physical challenge. If you're conducting one of these groups, you have to take into consideration the abilities of everyone in the group and not make it too difficult for the members who might not have as much ability as some of the other members. If you do that, then you'll avoid the possibility of frustrating some of the group members who are not able to succeed at the activity. Of course, if they're having some difficulty, then the rest of the group can support them and help them to conquer the challenge, whatever the challenge might be. Part of this is building a relationship with an outdoors environment, and it's also building relationships with all the participants in the group. This usually involves some therapy to help to improve your self-awareness and to remove mental blocks that are holding you back. For example, when we talked about the cob building or natural building earlier, there's actually a thing called cob therapy. And in that case, you're coming together to build a structure or a sculpture out of natural materials, but you're also doing it in a meditative way. For example, when I have conducted cob workshops in the past, I teach people basic meditation skills, and they do the activity in a meditative state. So that can help to remove mental blocks, help people to relax, reduce anxiety, reduce stress, that sort of thing. And that brings us to wandering. I'm going to read you a quote here from McCaffrey, 2014. The essence of wandering is to wander through the landscape without time, destination, agenda, or a future purpose to be present in the moment, and to go off trail whenever curiosity leads. There's an old uh, Celtic tradition called the walkabout, and in that case you're just wandering, and you're just seeing where the adventure, where the landscape takes you. This can be therapeutic, because you're not focused on any goal, you're just focused on the present. You're focused on natural attractions, and things that might call to you as you experience the natural environment. Also from McCaffrey is the Way of Counsel. This is an old tradition in indigenous tribes throughout the world. The Way of Counsel is a practice of speaking and listening from the heart through compassionate, heartfelt expression and empathic listening. Counsel inspires a non-hierarchical form of deep communication that reveals a group's vision and purpose. Counsel offers effective means of working with conflicts and for discovering the deeper, often unexpressed, needs of individuals. This is where the talking stick comes in handy. Sometimes it's like herding cats when you're trying to get people to agree on a particular topic or a particular goal. And in that case, the way of counsel makes sure that everyone is able to communicate, everyone has a chance to say what they need to say, and everyone is heard. When I do this sort of thing, I have everybody sit in a circle and pass the talking stick around, and everybody has the opportunity to speak because the talking stick is going around the circle. If they don't want to speak, they have the option of saying pass and giving it to the next person, but everyone is afforded an opportunity to make their voice heard. That concludes video hour one. The next one is video hour two, where we'll be talking about nature as nurture nature and child development, and an educative model of ecotherapy.
If you're watching this video on YouTube and you're interested in taking this course for credit, you can visit the Mindful Ecotherapy Center's website at mindfulecotherapy.org. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on video two.